Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is a detailed guide on how to build a PC inside the Corsair 2500D Airflow. Now, I've built in this case in three different ways, and I want to show you the steps for these and the things to think about along the way, as well as the possible mounting options of various different things like the fans and the all in one coolers and the CPU air towers, for example. And I want to talk to you about the things to know before you build and the important things to know about the specifications and the logic of how you'd lay this PC out. So I'm gonna jump into the build guide in a minute and I'll link to it in the timestamps down below so you can jump straight there. But I wanna show you some of the things of interest. For example, you need to make sure that you are aware of the logic of the motherboard compatibility. So this will work with mini ITX and micro ATX motherboards. This is a mini ITX version, a small and compact motherboard, which as you can see sits quite small on the motherboard tray and is potentially problematic because it means that there's a lot of different spaces for running cables through. Now, maybe this variation isn't the most logical choice as it's generally designed for small form factor cases and the cables perhaps can end up looking a bit messy. By the end of it, you can end up with a relatively clean looking build and it can be pretty nice as you've seen already with the Corsair fans and the setup there. Once you put a GPU in and things, it's not too much of a problem, but really you get a better experience out of it with a micro ATX motherboard like this Rear Connect MSI Project Zero motherboard. Now this is a motherboard that is designed to work really well with this case and the case it works well with the motherboard. It's larger, which means it fills up the case more nicely, but as you can see, it also has all its connections on the rear, so all your cabling can be hidden away, which can end up looking really neat. As you'll see, it fits in the standoffs in a more effective way, and then you can just run everything around to the rear, and you end up with a really clean build this way. There are some caveats to this though, because it still can be a bit of a problem in other ways, so I wanna quickly show you that as well. But as you can see, you can end up with very few cables at the front, which means a really clean build that's very eye-pleasing and perhaps a bit more aesthetically pleasing anyway because the motherboard is obviously taking up a lot more room in the case and these motherboards often have more features and things to them anyway. The other thing is this case can also take both an ATX, which is a standard size power supply unit, and a small form factor power supply as well as an alternative. This is a pretty large one as a demonstration. I put a couple of different thousand watt power supplies in there. So you can see that it's pretty spacious in the dual chamber setup. And you'll see the setup here. I'll leave all the specs in the description of the build so that you can find out more about it if you're curious of what I've used. But alternatively, you can use a small form factor power supply like this one. Using a small form factor power supply has its benefits because that means that PSU is taking up less space. This is still a thousand watt power supply, but it takes up less room in the case. It needs this bracket in order to fit it into the case, which is installed as standard. Another thing to bear in mind, you have to remove that if you want to use the ATX power supply instead. But what I found is the logical benefit to using one like this is this will work really well with the rear connect motherboard because the cables are shorter, which means there's less distance to run them and that's useful if using it on a rear connect because obviously they don't have to go very far but if using it on a front connect motherboard then you'd have to run the cables through and that can prove a little bit tricky and a bit of an issue so it depends what sort of motherboard you're buying which power supply makes more sense and something to keep in mind there but if you also want lots of space for cable management then obviously a small form factor is preferable now the other thing you'll notice is that i've also removed the hard disk drive cage and I'd suggest doing that really early on in your build because as you can see, I'm now plugging in the power cables for this motherboard. And I found that both types of motherboard make it a bit problematic to plug the cables in if you've got the hard disk drive cage in place still. You can see in one of the builds, I ended up with a real cabling mess back there. And I did that intentionally because I wanted to show that it was still possible to shut the door on this. So it is quite a roomy case. However, one thing I wanted to point out, if you are, a bit of a messy builder is that because the rear airflow panel has a lot of holes in it you can see the cables through there so your shame will not be that well hidden so that's worth bearing in mind now i would recommend actually taking the cables out so this is the front panel cables for the top buttons for the power reset switch 3.5 millimeter audio and usb connections and it makes sense to get those tidied before you do anything else in order to do this if you remove the little bracket at the rear you'll find in the hard disk drive cage that in one of them is a little box containing a bunch of things 
along with plastic cable ties and fan screws and motherboard screws and other things. By the way, those fan screws are also a consideration, which I'll get to in a second. They work really well with Corsair fans, so that's something to keep in mind. And then cable tie as much as you can. I'd recommend cable tying these front connections pretty early on, but just think about the logic of where they're going to sit. So if you're using a rear connect motherboard, for example, you can see them plugged in here. But I cable tied the hell out of these and all the power cables, and I'll show you more of that later on, because it makes managing the cables, especially if you're using a rear connect motherboard, a lot easier. And you'll see there are lots of hoops that you can use to cable tie. The other thing I'd suggest is removing the hard disk drive cage during the build process. Get this out nice and early, because it will make your life a lot easier if you are building whatever motherboard you're using because it means that you can access the rear of the motherboard which is obviously important if you want to install an all-in-one cooler and you need to put a bracket on the back of the motherboard for supporting the standoffs for example or if you want to access the power cables i found that running the power cables even to the mini itx motherboard was tricky because that hard disk drive cage was blocking in but on the rear connector was also problematic and the same goes for the power supply unit if you get that in too soon, you'll also have trouble accessing a lot of the ports on a rear connect motherboard as well. So you need to sort of plan the logic out. The other thing to bear in mind, actually, what I found was a problem is with a rear connect motherboard, the hard disk drive cage is actually very difficult, if not impossible, to get back in. I would suggest that it's not a good idea to put that cage in if you're planning on using a rear connect motherboard because it pushes down on those two 8-pin CPU power connectors that connect to the top of the motherboard and could be a bit problematic or dangerous. Now, the other thing with SSD mounting is that they install on the left-hand side of the case behind the fan tray or next to the fan tray. And there's two brackets for this, and I'll show you the installation process for it later on. But I want to highlight something, and that is that the cables for those could end up being a bit messy on that side. So it doesn't look great if you install them and that. The alternative option is to install the SSDs in the hard disk drive cage by using the screws and put them in these little brackets and then slipping them into the hard disk drive cage. You can put four SSDs in if you use both positions potentially or two hard disk drives in here and two SSDs at the front. So before you start building, you need to think about what storage you want to use and where you're going to locate it and the implications that will have on your motherboard or on the wiring of these things because it is a little bit complicated there depending on whether you're using a rear connect motherboard or whether you're trying to keep the cables neat and whatever else. So a little bit tricky and something to think about. But again, as you can see, that hard disk drive cage just gets in the way of the cables. Trying to run 8-pin power connectors even to the mini ITX motherboard was tricky because that cage was just blocking access up there as well. So something to think about. Included in that box that I showed you a minute ago with the various different accessories are these silver and white screws. These are fan screws that Corsair has kindly included to make your life a little easier, and they do if you're using Corsair fans. I'll talk about our orientation of fans in a second and how to mount them, but these screws are particularly interesting because they basically only take one turn to tighten them up, so you can really quickly and easily install fans in the various different places in the case. However, they seem to only work well with Corsair fans, so they screw those in really easily. However, what I found is if you try and use them with other fans, as I did with Lee and Lee's fans in this build, for example, I found that they weren't quite good enough for them. They kept falling out. So if you've got deeper fans or thicker fans, you might find there's a bit of an issue with these screws if you try and use them. So just watch out for that. Obviously, there's a lot of different potential build options and you may well use different fans to me. So I want to talk about what I've done and give you some suggestions for the orientation and logic of certain things. So if we start with Corsair's logic. I'm using AF120 RGB Elite fans here. We've got front, side and bottom fans all set to intake and then exhaust fans on a 360mm radiator on the top and one exhaust fan on the left hand side. For intake fans, you need to make sure you see the back of the fans for the airflow, so that will then pull the air through from the front, bottom and side, and that gives good cold air through the case onto the graphics card and then up through the radiator and out to keep things running cool. The other advantage of doing this with the RGB fans is obviously we've got a lot of air panels in this case, which means that you can see RGB lighting from multiple angles, including the back. So it does look pretty nice this way. Now with Lee and Lee's build, I'm using a 240mm Galahad cooler on the side mounting. 
and then reverse blade fans on that radiator and on the bottom, as well as intake fans on the front side and bottom of the case, and then exhaust out at the top with three exhaust fans on the top and one at the rear. The reverse blade fans are the SL120 reverse blades, and these are pulling cold air in from below and from the side, but you still get to see the front of the fans, but those front mounted fans are still set to intake, and they're the standard ones, which is why you can see the back. So there's a lot of options there, what you can do with Lee and Lee's fans and the reverse blade versions of those fans. For a more stealthy build, I used a deep cool digital CPU air tower, which I'll get to in a little while, along with uni fans, which are Lee and Lee's P28 uni fans, and they're, as you can see, black fans. But the same logic applies, the same intake setup with the front side and bottom all set to intake and then the exhaust out for the top and the rear. Obviously, if I covered every step of each of these builds, this video would be several hours long, but I do want to cover some things that may be useful. So if you're planning on using the same sort of setup with AF120 RGB Elites, I've done a separate wiring guide that I'll link to in the description that will help you out in the logic. Of course, there's fan wiring, and I'd also recommend getting two Commander Core XTs that you can see here or at least an additional one if you're using a Capilix cooler. So the Capilix cooler that you'll see me using comes with one of these, and you can wire in six fans for RGB and fan power and then control them with IQ. And obviously connecting up the amount of fans that I've got, we're going to need more than one because you've got a lot of fans to connect up. And using these hubs makes life a little bit easier. You can also mount one to the hard disk drive cage if you're going to be using that. I'm using the Corsair H150i Elite Capilix with an LCD upgrade kit here, and again, AF120 RGB Elite fans on that. Note that you could orientate the radiator the other way around if you wanted to, so you could have the tubes on the left-hand side. I opted to put them on the right. It doesn't really matter. It's an aesthetic thing, personal preference of where you're going to set it up, but top mounting this radiator is the only option for 360 millimeter in this case. So if you're using a large rad, then you need to put it on top of the case and then obviously exhaust air through it in order to get good airflow and a good aesthetic here. So that's how you'd mount the fans, remembering to point the cables towards the rear of the case. I'm using the LCD upgrade kit, but you can also buy this with an LCD display. So you can get that radiator with that display if you want to. And again, two commander cores are then part of that. So one comes with that cooler and an additional one for the extra fans. If you're planning on using as many fans as I am, this will make your life a lot easier. There are other ways, but it becomes even more complicated. I'd also recommend Corsair's USB hub. This is an internal USB hub that can take four USB ports and connect them up to a single one on your motherboard. That means you can connect up the commander cores and the display to the USB controller and then to your motherboard, which is solves problems if you've only got two USB connections on your motherboard. So it makes life a little bit simpler. Alternatively, you might want to opt for something like the in these uni fans. So this is the SL120 V2. So I've used reverse blade fans, as I mentioned already, on the bottom and on the radiator. Now these are fans that have the blades facing the opposite direction. You can see them in the bottom of this shot here. And what this means is that you can use them on the bottom of your case or on the side as I'm doing on the radiator. So you no longer need to see the backs as you're doing here, but instead you get to see the front of the fans and that will still be set to intake. So these are intaking air into the case, but you have a nice aesthetic for them and they look a bit nicer. Now these are uni fans, which means they're interlocking fans that then only require one cable per group of fans, which makes life a lot easier in terms of wiring, which make them ideal if you're trying to keep a really clean build with minimal wiring. Now I'm using a 240 millimeter cooler here, the Liam Lee Galahad 2 Trinity, which I'll leave links to in the description. And this can be mounted to this side tray. That tray can be used for fans or for radiators, and you can mount a 240 mil radiator on here. Now I'm going to use the intake fans with the reverse blades. So we're gonna pull cold air through the back of the case, through the radiator, and then into the case. I actually think this is preferable because it'll keep your CPU running cooler. I've done a guide that I'll link to in the description with the best places to mount your all-in-one cooler and I've done some testing to show the performance of this and I've found that this is actually the better way of doing it is to get cold air through that radiator to keep your case nice and cool. Now in terms of mounting the radiator, the logic is basically put the radiator on and then install the fan bracket on the rear. What I have found though, and it's worth noting this because you might 
find the same problems is it can be a little bit tricky to get it back in. I found that it was being blocked by this side panel and also that it was just a bit difficult to negotiate into the case. It's worth bearing in mind this is quite a thick radiator and quite thick fans so this is a bit problematic in this build and you may well find the same issues. The other thing I thought about doing was a push-pull setup with extra fans on the rear. Now this fan tray can actually be mounted in two positions. This one that I've got it in here and then you can set it a bit more forward and theoretically mount fans on the rear. Unfortunately I wasn't able to do this because the fans are too thick and it results in them pressing up against the front fan tray. So an issue for me, but if you're using a different setup with maybe a Corsair radiator instead, you might be able to seat the rad a bit further forward like this and then install it. I found unfortunately I just couldn't do it and it wouldn't fit in this position no matter how I tried. And that's just because the radiator was pressing up against that and then that meant the fan tray kept popping out. But I thought I'd mention that it is possible. You can see there is enough space there. So depending on the build, you might be able to do it. I did it with the standard fan tray. So if you're just putting a fan tray in with no rad on it, it is possible to get into the further forward position. And this looks a little bit nicer, I think, aesthetically in that way, because it hides away the SSD cabling for a start that you'll see. And also it sets that fan deeper into the case, which then makes it look a little bit nicer. So it's worth thinking about what you're going to do here, whether you're mounting fans or radiators on it, and then what position you want to put it in and try and work that out beforehand because then that'll make the build go a lot more smoothly. But you can see with the radiator on here, it's sitting a bit further back. It's not perfect. I'm not 100% happy with it, but it still does work in this position. With all that in mind, we're going to go back in time now to the beginning of when I first got this out of the box, and I'm going to show you the various different steps of building in this case, setting up your motherboard and the thought process between installing all the different things and the logic for it and cable management and all those other things. But we'll start by obviously taking the panels off. The glass panel comes off with thumb screws on the side here, and then you just need to pull it towards you and then lift it up and that'll then come out. There are some notches on the bottom that hold it in place to stop it falling. So you do need to lift it up ever so slightly when pulling it out. The top panel comes off pretty easily. You just tug it upwards towards you. And you'll notice that on these panels, there is mesh on the inside of them to help with dust management. So keep an eye on that over time because you might find dust build up there. And on the front, you do the same thing. That just pulls off as well and you'll store those somewhere safe. On the underside, there's also a slide out dust tray down here with a filter, which will stop the dust getting into the bottom of the case through those intake fans. This can be slid out and cleaned in future. I'd recommend setting it aside for now during the build process because it'll make life easier installing the bottom fans. The rear airflow panel also comes off with two thumb screws held in place pretty simply. And again, there's mesh back there to stop the dirt ingress. So that should be good over time. Now the standard setup here, as I mentioned a few different things, I'd recommend removing that hard disk drive cage. So we're going to start by having a look there. Don't forget the accessories box is included in here in the disk drive cage and that includes all the screws you'll need for the motherboard installation, the SSD and a hard disk drive installation and other things like the plastic cable ties that we'll be using. I'd recommend removing this entirely, even if you're installing SSDs or hard disk drives, it'll make it easier for the build process. Now, I quickly want to go and show you the setup for this installing and setting up the motherboard, first of all, including the NVMe, CPU, RAM, and more. This is a Project Zero board, which is a 14th gen Intel setup, but it'll work with 12th and 13th gen CPUs, if you prefer. And don't forget all the connectors are on the rear, so I'm gonna show you the plugging in of those in a second. Now for Intel's CPU, you just install it gently with the gold triangle in the bottom left corner here, lift the flap up, carefully put it in where the notches sit on it, and then gently push it down into place. Close the flap, put the pin down over the top, and lever it in. The NVMe SSDs, you have to take off that heat shielding on the top, you project and zero those two ports there, use the top one, slot your drive into there, in this case the Corsair MB600 Elite, and then notch it back down with the little latch on the left hand side. Note if you don't have a heat sink on your drive, use the included one and remove that sticker first and then seat it back down. We're using Crucial's DDR5 Pro Series RAM for this build, two sticks and you need to install them in slots A2 and B2, which is the second slot from the left and then the fourth slot, so the one right over there. Those are the correct slots for the installation of two sticks. Make sure you follow that guidance. 
notch up those two little clips on the top and then seat your ram in there and then carefully push it in. It'll only go in one way, so try not to force it. Make sure you line up the notches properly underneath and then push it in until you hear a click and then it should be into place nice and easily. For the motherboard installation, you'll notice that there are various different standoffs pre-installed in the case. You'll actually need to move one for the micro ATX setup. You can see a legend here of where the standoffs are located and where they should be depending on which ones you're using. But I found for this motherboard, the standoff positions, the one additional standoff that needs to be repositioned in order for it to fit. You can see markings on the back of the motherboard carefully indicating where to avoid collision in the motherboard from standoffs because it could cause drama and problems. But the one we want to fill in is this bottom one right next to the USB ports. If you look down here at the bottom middle, you'll find there's one standoff there it actually needs to move down to the port below that. If you use a tool to remove that, you should find it included in the little box of accessories. Remove that standoff and then put it in the lower position instead. For this build, I'm using Deepcool's AK500 Digital Air Tower Cooler. This is a pretty simple setup. I'm going to show you the process for installing this. This is an LGA1700 socket motherboard as reference. And this cooler comes with a single fan and it has a digital display on it that you'll see it gives you temperature readouts and utilization and other things as well. So it's pretty neat and easy to install. First of all, you need to get the back plate, set the standoffs into the four corners, the furthest corners. This goes on the back of the motherboard. So I'd recommend doing it before trying to put the motherboard into the case. Install it into here by pushing the standoffs through to the other side, and then we're going to secure it in place. There are four screws that need to be screwed down over the top of those standoffs, basically double-sided and they then have an additional screw that sticks up that we're going to put some bracketing on. So just screw those down and secure them tightly and then you'll find these brackets clearly marked with CPU pointing inwards and then one, two and three as notches there. You need to make sure you line up the screws on those standoffs. Number two for LJ1700 socket. Seat these down over there and then secure those brackets with a standoff. Notice that this one that I'm using has the CPU labeling facing inwards. So there's an arrow that points where the CPU should be. So this is the indication for that on that side. And then obviously the one on the left hand side has the opposite pointing in towards the middle. Same sort of logic though. It goes on the point two. So you need to make sure the standoffs come through the holes marked two on each of these. And then it's secured down with the thumb screws on top. That's securing that bracket there. Then we need to use the thermal paste. So we apply some thermal paste to it and pop that on. And then we're going to spread that out. I like to give a good spread across the IHS to make sure it's entirely covered and has some good thermal paste coverage. And then we're going to install the cooler itself. Now, in order to do this, we need to remove one of the fans, which is held in place with clips on either side and secured there because that then means that you can access one of the screws that you need to secure. You also need to take off this top plate, which is the display, because in order to access another screw, the tool that comes included with this cooler has to go through the cooler itself and into that screw. You'll note that there's cabling on this display that also needs to be plugged in. Don't forget to remove this plastic sticker on the bottom as well. You've got to peel that off before you put the cooler down in place, otherwise you won't have good thermal performance from your cooler. Seat that down over the standoffs that we've installed on those brackets and then secure it by gently screwing in each of these. So on this right hand side screw, for example, we screw it in a few turns to try and secure it a little bit. Then we move on to the one on the left. Now, in order to do that, as I said, you need to remove the display off the top then put the tool through the middle of the cooler and to reach the screw on the other side. Now, I found that I had to basically have a look get low down so I could see through the bottom of the cooler to be able to make sure the screwdriver was going all the way through and going into the screw. Not easy to see from this angle and not easy to record. So I'd recommend just getting your face down so you can see where it is and then secure each of these. You'll notice that I'm going back and forth between these, tightening them up until they won't go any further. Be careful not to over tighten so don't go hard on it, just gently until it stops. Then we need to re-secure the fan with the brackets on either side. It just clips onto the side of the fan and then you've got a CPU fan cable. So this is a power cable coming from the fan and quickly demonstrate how to plug this in. So here it is off there again, but basically you've got to plug it into the CPU fan header on your motherboard. 
There's a couple of different demos. Obviously on the one I'm using, it's on the rear of the case. You're looking for CPU fan, and then that single fan connector from the fan comes and plugs into that. And that'll allow your motherboard to control the fan speed and ensure that fan spins to cool the CPU down by cooling the radiator. So then there are a couple of other cables coming out of this as well. We have a USB connection and a five volt RGB header connection going from that. So the five volt RGB header looks like this. You can see it's got three pins on it, so don't try and plug it in anywhere else. Look for the five volt RGB or rainbow or J rainbow connection on your motherboard. On the one I'm using, it's JA RGB on the back of the motherboard near the 24 pin power connector. You plug it in there. And also then you need to plug in the USB cable as well, which goes in the bottom of the motherboard. On standard motherboards, it's bottom front. On the motherboard I'm using, it's obviously bottom middle at the back and you plug that in that enables your computer to then control the display you have to download deep cool software in order to be able to do that so there's some software for the cooler that then will show you the various different temps and utilizations of your system then we can seat the motherboard down in place obviously taking care to put it gently on the standoffs so you don't damage anything at the rear and making sure there's nothing in the way you have to seat this so that the back connectors sit through the various holes in the case and then we secure it with the various different screws included in the accessories box there are a number of them basically flat headed ones black screws that you secure in the various different points throughout there you should find that you're screwing in eight different standoff screws as they pointing through into the various positions three across the top three across the middle and then two down the bottom then we need to try and tidy those cables up. So the cables I just showed you, obviously we're gonna plug them in at the rear of this motherboard. So running them through to the rear as neatly as possible. And I would recommend cable tidying these as well once you get around the back. You'll find that there are a lot of loops on the back of this case where you can use the plastic cable ties to secure them. Where you do that is probably gonna be up to you based on where you think is the most logical point for this. I've already done it with the front panel connectors, but now I'm starting to do it with the fans and the other connectors as well to make sure it's nice and neat throughout. This will be important later on, but also ensures good airflow. Now for the connections from the top of the case, we've got front panel connector, 3.5 mil USB-A and USB-C. The front panel connector goes to the bottom left of this motherboard. We're looking for F panel as the connector there, or JF p1 in this instance that controls both the power button and the reset switch on top of the case usually this is on the bottom right of standard motherboards but on this one it's on the left as you're looking at it from behind then the usb a cable plugs in near the 24 pin power connector on the left hand side along with the usb c connection these are for the top ports on top of the case so you can use those ports when you want to the USB-C will only go in one way, as will the USB-A. USB-A's got a little notch on it. USB-C, you have to make sure you're facing it all the way around, and then you'll feel a click when you seat it into place. Just basically push it down until you feel a click, and if it won't click in, you've got it the wrong way around. Turn it around and push it again until it clicks. Be careful not to force it and damage anything, but just be wary that you do need to make sure it's facing the right way, because it won't go in either way, unlike USB-C, which usually can be plugged in any way you want. Then the 3.5 millimeter audio plugs in the bottom right. This is HD audio, which is the jack on top of the PC. In this instance, it's JAUD1 on the bottom right there. So you then connect that up. On the usual motherboard, it's on the bottom left. And then secure the cables in the various different places. I'd recommend doing this as you go along. Next up, I'm gonna remove this fan tray from the left-hand side, and we're gonna put 220 millimeter fans on it. I'm going to use Lee and Lee's Unifans because they're really simple to install and they use minimal amount of cables because they're interlocking fans that connect together and then have a single cable coming out of them. So these are Lee and Lee's P28 fans. They don't have any RGB, so this is a bit of a stealth build. I'm mounting them with the fan blades facing towards the back. So I mount them onto this so that they face towards the rear. This is so it works as intake fans, so air's being sucked from the back of the case. This will then be combined with the two fans on the front of the case, which I'm going to install the same direction so that the air is coming from the front and the side is intake. So we've got a lot of cold air coming in from there. Use the screws that are included with the Lee and Lee's fans because they're thicker to make sure these are secured well to the bracket. 
And then obviously you need to think about where the wire is going as well. So as you can see, it's running to the bottom of the case. Now we're re-securing this bracket into the case and then I'm gonna run that cable to a cis fan header. You'll notice that there are two different points where you can mount this bracket. You can stick it to the rear here as standard in that position, or you can actually move it further in and seat it down on an inner position, which means that the fans are sitting a bit more further forward. Now I would actually recommend doing this because I'm mounting SSDs to the side of the case in this instance, and that will mean that the cables for those are hidden away a bit more. Then we'll plug the fan cable into the cis fan or chassis fan header on the motherboard, which you can see here in the bottom next to the USB connections. You should find multiples of these on your motherboard and one per group of fans. Now I'm gonna put two more fans with the same sort of logic on the front of the case, screw them in from the inside, but put the fans on the outside, and that will then pull cold air from the front as well. So I've got two lots of fans pulling cold air in from here, and then some from below as well. I'm basically making sure I've got lots of cold air coming in from different directions and securing that to the front fan tray. These fans then have the cable running to the rear as well. And you kind of have to tidy them up a little bit. I ended up tying these a little bit at the back and just trying to get them through the holes down the bottom there so they weren't very visible to make sure it's nice and neat. Because the goal here is to end up with a really neat case from the front so the cables aren't really visible. It is a little bit tricky, but the benefit of these fans is very minimal amount of cables. Plug that into a separate system fan header and that will then ensure those fans are powered by the motherboard. So we're going to use multiple different system fan headers for each of the different fan connectors in here. Then I'm putting three fans on top of the case with the blades facing downwards into the case. So the backs of the fans are secured to the top of the case. That will ensure we've got exhaust fans. So these three fans are sucking air up out of the top of the case and away. So that will take out the warm air. And then I'm going to secure that and plug that into a system fan header. There's one on the top left near the CPU fan header that I showed you earlier on. So we now have loads of fans plugged in. For the power supply unit, I'm using Corsair's RM1000E. I'll link below to a guide on how to choose the right power supply unit for you. This is just one example of a power supply you could use. We need two cables, the 24 pin power supply cable and two 8 pin CPU power connectors. So these are plugging into the part marked motherboard and then CPU headers. So the 24 pin is the most important. We need to make sure that's secured properly. I'm going to demonstrate this outside the case with a separate motherboard to get an idea of where it installs. But you can see it's in two parts on the power supply end and you need to connect that up and push that in. The logic for these cables are the same mostly across nearly all power supply units, especially if they're modular. So even if you've not got this one, the logic should be the same anyway. But you're seating these cables into place, make sure you push them in all the way and that they click into place with those clips. You need to make sure it's secured both this end and the motherboard end to make sure your computer will power on properly. The standard motherboard they plug in on the right hand side here and again, you need to make sure that cable is pushed all the way in so that it seats in there properly and clicks into place. Now, this cable, if it's loose, will stop your PC from powering on properly. And obviously on the motherboard I'm using, that cable is actually plugging in on the rear. I want to demonstrate a few different options just in case you're not using exactly the same setup. This motherboard I'm using in the case requires two 8-pin CPU power connectors. Those do need to be set in here as well. So you look for the CPU cables and then plug them into the part marked CPU and PCIe on the power supply end and then plug the end marked CPU into the motherboard. Now I'm showing this all outside the case where it's really clear. Obviously you'd actually do this once the power supply is installed in the case and the motherboard is as well. But I wanted to demonstrate without obstruction where these cables plug in. So the top left, two eight pin power connectors, clearly marked CPU, plugged in and connected in there and pushed all the way in so the clips are fully seated and that is ready as well. Now you can see to demo the back of this Zero Project Zero motherboard, they plug in on the left hand side of the 24 pin and then the top right for the 8 pin CPU power connectors. And again, this is the view that you'll see once you get it installed in the case, put it in there and plug those cables in, make sure they're all seated in properly. Now that's what you need for the motherboard powering. Obviously I'm gonna show you everything else as well because your graphics card and other things are gonna need powering too. And depending on what else you're doing, you might need some additional cables. So it's worth getting them all plugged in initially. So 
I am using an SSD and a hard disk drive as demonstration purposes here. And you'll want SATA power if you're going to use any of these drives. Two cables need to be plugged in from the drives, the power cable and the data cable. So we'll start with the power cable, which looks like this. You should find these flat daisy chain connectors on a single cable. And essentially you've got multiple connectors on there so you can actually plug in multiple drives from your power supply. What you want to do is look for the parts marked SATA and plug your cable in there on the power supply end. The SATA connection will power hard disk drives, SSDs, fan controllers and other things too. In this instance, I'm just using this SSD from Kingston and a hard disk drive for demonstration purposes from Seagate. I'm actually gonna be using two crucial SSDs in the build, but I have these to be able to demonstrate that as well. So you can see there's an L-shaped connector on this daisy chain cable that plugs into the drives and you can't get it the wrong way around. And then you should find these other data cables included with the motherboard small little ones with metal clips on they plug into the drive and then to your motherboard and that will ensure the data can be transferred back and forth and that you can access what you need to you can daisy chain the power for these things together but not the data so you need two separate cables for each of the drives and then we're going to move into the graphics card powering now there are different setups depending on the gpu you're using this is a RTX 3090 for demonstration purposes, which uses a traditional 8-pin PCIe power connector. We need two of them for this GPU. It may vary. You might need three, you might need one. Depends what graphics card you're using. But we need two connectors, and I'd recommend using the separate connectors that are a single connector on either end. And again, we're looking for the PCIe slash CPU power connectors here. Plug in the end into the power supply and then plug in the other end marked PCIe into your graphics card. So if you use those two, you'll notice that on one end, the cable is actually split into two parts. So you need to push those two parts together. On some power supplies, they actually notch together so they clip together properly and then you just push it in. But you need to make sure that all the parts are pushed all the way into your graphics card because if the second bit is a bit loose, then that may mean that your GPU is not getting enough power and therefore you're not getting the potential frames and other things out with the performance that you need. We're, alternatively, we're using a 40 series graphics card in this build, and here's a gigabyte one for demonstration. Those have that 12 volt high power connector on them, and the RM1000E will work with Corsair's special cable, which has two connectors on one end in this instance, connects up to your power supply unit in the same way we just done with two PCIe power connectors. And on the other end, you've got a single 12 volt high power connector, which connects up to the graphics card. So the same logic applies. Plug one end into your power supply unit, and then the other end just plugs into the graphics card. Now this is in place of the adapters that you usually get with 40 series cards. And it's a lot neater because you don't have to worry about having multiple cables coming out of your GPU but you do need to make sure that cable's pushed all the way in and carefully seated so it's fully clipped in there and that won't then lead to any problems in the build. Then we're seating the power supply into the case. Now the reason I plugged in all those cables beforehand is it's a lot easier to do that and then put the PSU in than it is to have to think about how to plug them in afterwards. Also seat it so that the fan faces the outside of the case. This will allow the power supply unit to pull cold air in through that side perforated panel and keep the power supply cool. We then have four screws that we need to screw into the back of the case. Now note, this is an ATX power supply unit, which means you need to remove the other bracket that's included with the case that's used for the small form factor power supply unit. So first of all, you have to remove that bracket, and then you screw this one in with four screws that are included in the four corners where you can see the screw holes in the points on the power supply there. And then we run the cables through. Once again, two 8-pin CPU power connectors go to the top right on this rear connect motherboard. You plug those in there. And then I recommend trying to secure those down, especially cable tying them neatly out of the way. This is really important if you're going to be using the hard disk drive cage, and I'll show you why in a little while. But also it just makes sure everything's neat. So as you're going through each of these steps, I recommend just cable tidying these cables out of the way individually because it becomes quite messy and difficult otherwise. Then put the 24 pin power connector in, make sure that's notched in and clicks in properly. And then this is a bit more tricky, this one to secure, but you can see there are still some potential loops that we could use with the plastic cable ties. So you can seat these down 
and then tie them down in those spots there. Put them in, secure them down, and then zip tie them in there and tighten those up. Now, I used absolutely loads of cable ties in this build, so many that I actually bought some extras. You might not need to go over the top like this, but I wanted to make sure it was well secure back here and everything was nice and neat so that none of the cables pressed on the rear of the motherboard or any any of the connectors on the back of the motherboard don't want to cause any shorts or any dangerous problems then go through with a pair of scissors and cut off the extra cable tie plastic taking care not to cut through the wires while doing it be very careful with this because that could happen especially if you're using larger scissors now for the ssd mounting you'll notice on the left hand side of the case where I installed those two fans on that radiator tray, there are two trays for SSD mountings. So you need to remove those and then secure the SSDs to them. Obviously, this is a pain if you've already installed the fan tray, so apologies for that. But I want to show you the steps for these and maybe why you don't want to install them there anyway, because it can be a problem. But these brackets basically sit over the rear of the SSD and then use four screws to secure them to the SSDs. So pay attention here to the direction of face the connectors. You'll notice that they're sticking out at the bottom there so that when you put them back into the case, they're easy to plug the cables into in theory. You'll notice that the trays have little notches on them that sit into the case themselves and then a thumb screw holds that tray in place. Now these are in a tricky position in the review, I said this was a stupid place to put them, and you'll see why in a second. But you've got to run the power cable from your power supply unit that I showed you earlier somehow across the bottom here and plug into both those SSDs, or one if you're only using one. And then you'll find that there's a bit of a mess there because these are not very neat in this position. So it's good to have fans on that fan tray to hide them away. You also probably have trouble negotiating them around, but you can plug both SSDs into one cable, it will reach and it is possible to do. But then you also need to run the data cables as well, don't forget from this position, and you will find that it does end up being a bit messy. Now for the hard disk drives, if you've got a 3.5 inch hard disk drive, you can install that in this caddy. So there's some clips on the inside of this from the hard disk drive cage that slot into the sides of the hard disk drive and you'll notice the way around it goes there so again the cable connections are sticking out at the end there's also four screw holes on here so you can use screws that are included in the box to secure the drive as well so not only is it clipped into place but it's screwed into the tray as well and then the tray then mounts back into the hard disk drive cage which is installed at the rear of the case as I'll show you in a second so fairly simple in install you can put two hard disk drives into this cage or alternatively, you can put SSDs in here instead. So if you want to, you could install four SSDs in the case potentially, although you do have the problem that I've mentioned where the cables for the 8-pin CPU power connectors can cause some issues there, but that's going to vary depending on what you're putting into your build, whether you want to do that or not. So if we're using hard disk drives, they slot in there, and then you use the SATA power connectors, so the flat connectors that I showed you earlier, you connect those up to the hard disk drive, and you could obviously connect two hard disk drives to this, both in that cage. And then once again, the data cable runs from the hard disk drives to your motherboard. And you'd need a separate cable for each of these. And they plug in on the right hand side of the motherboard or on the rear connect motherboard, at the rear on the left. But you're looking for the SATA connectors here. You can see we've got SATA 5 and 6 on this left hand side, for example. Now, if you're then resecuring the hard disk drive cage, note, as I said, that it puts some pressure on the 8-pin CPU power cables up here. If you're not using a rear connect motherboard, that might not be a problem. But for me, despite having really thin power connectors on here, this is pushing up against those. So I ended up not using it because it doesn't seem safe. So I just got rid of it because I don't think that's pushing in the right place there. Now for installing the graphics card, I actually had a problem with this. So I'm going to recommend something which is taking off this bracket at the rear. There's a bracket at the rear which is held in place with two thumb screws. If you remove that, then mount your graphics card to this with a couple of screws that are included there. It's much, much easier to then install the GPU. This is really weird, but it is the issue that I've had with installing the graphics card on here. 
and I don't really know why. It's a weird thing about the design, but it was not easy to get in in the standard way. So this seemed easier and safer. So you then have to slide your GPU in from the left-hand side, push it into that top PCIe X16 slot, push it down, and then re-secure the thumb screws on the outside of that bracket to then secure the graphics card in place. It's worth noting that there is also a vertical GPU mount you could potentially use in this case if you wanted to. And then we plug in the 12 volt high power power connector. And then you just put the rear of the case back together. So putting that back over there and obviously that shuts nice and neatly because we've done a good job there. And turn your PC on and make sure everything's running properly. Now you will notice that the fans are spinning at maximum speed, which is really loud. And that's because the BIOS needs changing. So turn the PC on, mash delete, go into the BIOS. And then we're looking to change some settings. Turn on XMP and then head over to hardware monitor. And then what you want to do is basically check that temps aren't too hot, which they aren't in this instance. And then we need to go into each of the system fan headers that we've used. So system one, for example, and change it to PWM mode instead of DC. Do this for each of the fan connectors you've connected, put it into PWM mode, and then the PC will automatically adjust the speed of the fans and you should find they ramp down and they're no longer at full speed and it will be a lot quieter. You can also make some adjustments in Windows via MSI's software, MSI Center, in order to change that as well, but I wanted to show you quick settings that you could do in the BIOS to sort it out. And then once you've downloaded the software for the deep cool cooler, you should see a display on that too. And you should find your PC now works wonderfully. And all you've got to do is go about installing Windows. Hopefully you found this useful. If you did, check out the links in the description to find out more and see related content. And let me know if I should have built one of the other builds in here and gone into the guide on those, Lee and Lee, Corsair, whatever else. What would you expect to see in a case or has this been a useful guide for you if you've made it all the way to the end please let me know down below because it would really help me out i'm curious to see what people would like to see more of in the future thanks for watching you've made it right to the end of the video you brilliant legend you if you've enjoyed it click that subscribe button give me a thumbs up and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions if you really enjoyed it consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.